Well, good morning, Walden Church. This morning, I have a question for you. Have you seen this picture? Jesus knocking. Probably, right? Probably. My grandmother uh, had it in a hallway right above her phone. Her phone used to sit on this little end table in a hallway. She had a pad of paper and a pen where she would write down notes, and it was on the way to the bathroom. So I had to pass this picture as a kid every time I needed to use the bathroom. So Jesus, Jesus is knocking, but it was probably just my bladder. Uh, I've met lots of people who either have this picture or this one. Do you remember this one? Very popular. It's like Jesus is posing for his picture on the $1 bill. But it's not an uncommon thing for some people to have a picture of Jesus in their home. And I mentioned this uh, because last week we talked about idols, we talked about worship, and I've been asked before if having a picture like this is bad. I is that an idol? And no, I, I don't think so. But what about the verse that we read last week? Exodus 20 says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. Well, yeah, but I think pictures of Jesus help us remember Jesus. It keeps him in our thoughts and reminds him of, our, of his presence in our lives. Just so long as we don't you know, bow down to the picture, right? We're not bringing the picture offerings. We're not bringing the picture sacrifices. But I wanted to kind of just go off on this tangent. I wanted to kind of walk down this road this morning, take a path kind of to the left of this topic and maybe explore something else. You know, sometimes I think we have these times together and we discuss something and then the next week we're just on to the next subject and maybe sometimes you're still wrestling with last week. Maybe the beginning of each time together, I need to be sensitive to your journey. You know, how have you been? What have you been thinking about? I've been wondering if worship is hard for some of us because God is this great unknown thing. I, I know sometimes people stand up in front of audiences and they claim to know God, they claim to speak for God. Still others will write books about him, still others will write songs about him. And all of those things just seem to fall a little short. They're like these two-dimensional images, right? There, there has to be more. This can't be all there is. When I scroll through TikTok, I see skeptics and atheists. They want answers. They want to debate. And they want to challenge our faith or they want to challenge scripture because they think that they have it all figured out. Do you know what I think? I don't think any of us have it all figured out. Christians are not smarter. Atheists are not smarter. How can any of us claim to understand God? Atheists don't want to worship God because they just don't get it. Christians maybe think about, maybe worship God for a few hours a week. Maybe they don't get it. You know, there's a story told of a group of scientists and they came to God one day and they said, well, God, we finally did it. Uh, we really don't have any use for you anymore. We have figured out how to make humans out of dirt, just like you did. God said, really? Okay, well, then we should have a, a person-making contest. And the scientist said, you're on. So some of the scientists bent over, they grabbed some of the dirt, and God said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You go get your own dirt. We can't even make dirt, right? We're talking about the almighty, powerful creator spoke the universe into existence, God. A being so incredible. Once when Moses said, you know, I'd really like to see your face. And God laughed and said, you can't take it. He said, I'm not your buddy. I'm not a person with a face and a smile. How can we worship or debate or discuss a being that we can't understand? I mean, do you understand God? 
When God does something in your life, are you like, oh yeah, I totally get that. I get it. Yeah, I, I know exactly why that happened. And this probably would be a good time for me to take out a prop, right? Use an example, use an analogy. Try to make God relatable. Try to make God understandable. Let's compare him to something else that we understand. That's what we do here in church, right? We read the Bible and then we try to simplify it and make it digestible. We take huge theological concepts and then we make them portable. I don't know that we, we want to do that with God. I can't reduce God to an example. I can't say, well, in a lot of ways, God is like this. Because God is not like anything. In the Wednesday Bible study, we were reading Isaiah 6. Isaiah got to stand in the throne room. He saw God, he saw the heavens, saw the inner court more closely than anyone else has ever seen. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to the other and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. These are angels, right? Not humans, not people. These are otherworldly beings, beings that when humans see them in the Bible, they're afraid. These beings repeatedly spend their day saying that God is holy, holy, holy. Holy means sacred. Holy means set apart. Holy means not like anything else by definition. So I can't compare a holy God to anything because holy means not like anything anything. <laughs> you know what? Let's, let's never simplify God. I think atheists and Christians get in trouble when we try to explain God, when we try to use a simple term, or when we say, oh, I know what this means. I have it figured out. This means this. See, God is so easy to carry. He fits neatly into this little box. That's wrong. We've all done it. I've done it. Someone asked me to explain the Trinity once. I said, well, God is a lot like water. Water is three things, but all of those things are H2O, right? Water is a liquid, it's a solid, it's a gas. And even though those three things are separate, and we call them separate things, they all have separate names, they all have the same molecular compound. And you might listen to that and say, yeah, that's, that's not bad. But God is not like water. Yep, God is like water. We got the Trinity all figured out. No, <laughs> that's ridiculous. I've done it, I've said it, I know. But holiness, by its definition, is inexplainable. He is set apart, so an analogy, any analogy, is going to be wrong. Isaiah 40 says, to whom then Will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? Moses first encounters God. He's a burning bush. And God says, you're going to go back to Egypt, and you're going to walk right into Pharaoh's throne room, and you're going to negotiate the release of my people. And Moses says, on whose authority? I'm not a king. And God says, my authority. And Moses says, who are you? And what does God say? He says, tell Pharaoh, I am. I am. What is that? No name? God can't be reduced to a name. God doesn't have a business card. God doesn't have a name tag. Moses is having a moment. He's talking to a bush. The bush is talking back. And Moses is trembling. And he says, how shall I describe you? And God says, tell Pharaoh, I am like water. <laughs> no. God says, I am that I am. That is such a powerful statement. I am that I am? This is very important to understand. Because he's saying, I can't give you a name. 
to go back and be like, oh, he's like this, he's like that. I don't have a word to encapsulate myself. Just know that I am. I mean, that's powerful. There's nothing you can compare me to. I just exist. I am. Just tell them that. Tell them that's who sent you. Do you know the ancient Hebrews took this answer and they used God's answer to give him a name? They call him Hashem. Hashem just means the name. He is Hashem. That's it. The Hebrews would never call God Yahweh or Jehovah because that implied that they were worthy to call God by name, worthy to be on a first name basis with God. So instead, in conversation, they would call God Hashem, the name, or they would call him Adonai, which just means Lord. Hashem is a way of saying God is so sacred. He's too holy. They don't even call him God because that puts him in the same arena as Zeus and Hercules and Isis and Poseidon and Apollo and Chris Hemsworth. So he's just, he's just so far beyond. He just is who he is. My job, when you think about it, is ridiculous. Right? Every week I try to explain God in 30 minutes. Instead, I would rather just confess to you we cannot understand him completely. We get glimpses here and here, and mostly all we can really do is surrender. All we can really do is obey. I mean, look at this passage. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? This is God speaking. He says, what are you comparing me to? Can you come up with something where you can compare me to a person? Is there a person that you can say, well, he's like him or he's like her? He says, who's my equal? God says this about himself. And then we have Job 11. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? You know, I've heard critics say, well, Jesus can't be God because he said that he didn't know the day or hour that he would return, so he's not all-knowing. Or that God isn't God because God allows suffering. He allows slavery. He allows wickedness. He allows the church to lower the status of women. He allows the crusades and on and on and on. And Job 11 says, oh, I get it. You've got it all figured out. Uh-huh. Can you figure out God's limits? Like what he can and can't do? Wait, you think your mind could figure out God? Let me just, yeah, let me just hear what you're saying. Like your brain and your reason and your logic came to a conclusion that what? Tell me your brilliant insights on God. Isaiah 55 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thought. I want to show you a picture. This is where my wife took me a few weeks ago. This is the Lanier Theological Library. It's on uh, Hargrave Road in Houston. And all of these books are about God, right? Which means all of these books are really about one book. These, these are the thoughts of humanity about God. And this is a small theological library. This is a private library. And God says, even in all of those books, you could read them all. You could understand them all, and you still would not be close to understanding me. As high as the heavens. Think about the heavens. Think about how we keep building these bigger and better telescopes and more expensive satellites. And, you know, now we can see further and further and further. And, and we look at that and we're like, wow. The universe and space, there's no end. It just keeps going and going and going. You know, people want to know, well, how did God start? What, you know, what was God's first day? Where, how did he come to exist? Who made God? And God says, I have no beginning. I have no ending. I am who I am. 
I know we would say that we believe the Bible, but do we even believe this verse? It's like when we experience pain or loss and then we just try to figure it out. Why did God do this? Why did God allow this? You know, let's get, let's get out pen and paper and, and make a chart. And God is looking down and going, pen and paper? I can't be reduced to a chart or a graph. My ways can't be dissected in a theological library. Hebrews 11 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Colossians says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Right? Right? We all agree. So this is like, okay, you get out your paper and crayons and you draw a stick figure. You draw your little person, right? And then your stick figure person drawing says, hey, I know you made me and I understand why. I've got it all figured out. And you say, no, you don't. I made you. You wouldn't even exist without me. And I existed years before I ever even thought of you. And I could just as easily throw you away. Tell me something. Why did God create Satan? Why did God create evil? I mean, if I were going to make the world, I would have done it differently can't believe God is God if he made evil. If he made the devil, who would have done that? All-knowing, all-powerful. If God is all-knowing, why did he make Hitler? If God knows everything, why not skip all of this down here? If he knows who's going to be saved and who isn't, just take Christians straight to heaven now. Why wait? I guess those are good questions, but they all have the same answer. The answer is, there's a being who exists that we refer to as the name, that we refer to as Lord, and he's on a completely different thought level, and his ways are not our ways. He doesn't think like us. He doesn't do things like us. In fact, when he does something, it's on such a different level. The distance between how he thinks and acts is so different from us that it's the distance between our planet and the galaxy HDI, 13.5 billion light years from the Earth. Look, I think it's, it would be easier for us to explain why Pluto is no longer a planet to an ant than to try to explain God. Psalm 145 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. How great is God? He's so great that you don't even get it. <laughs> There's a being in heaven right now that you cannot even get your mind around. Can you accept that? Are you willing to accept that your brain cannot understand the totality of God? It's hard to believe because we feel like we should be able to. I, I should be able to understand it, right? I mean, I've been to a museum. I've seen paintings of Monet. I've seen paintings of Rembrandt. I bet that with some paint and a few years of super intense study, I could copy one of his paintings stroke for stroke. It's possible. If I try really hard, you know, when people say, it's not rocket science, I think if I had the books, if I had a good teacher, if I had years of intense study, I could understand rocket science. I have physical limitations, absolutely. I'm never going to play pro football, no matter how hard I try. But I bet if I started right now, I could learn to play the guitar and be really good at it. If I just applied myself, if I didn't do anything else, if I sat in my room and studied all day for years, I bet I could learn something new and be smarter in certain fields. I could get a second, I could get a third master's degree. If I applied myself, I could get a doctorate. And I, and I can think like that. 
And I know about God, and I know about the Bible, but I'm an average person. <laughs> I mean, why else am I standing here, right? I read these verses, and God says, you know that as a mortal human, you have limits. And one of those limits is understanding me. In fact, you can't even fathom how great I am. You can sit in that library and study all day long, lock yourself in a room and try to figure it out. You can work harder than anyone who's ever lived and you're not gonna do it. You're never gonna get it. J.I. Packer said this is where most of us go astray. Our thoughts of God are not great enough. We fail to reckon with the reality of his limitless wisdom and power because we ourselves are limited and weak. We imagine that at some points God is too and find it hard to believe that he is not. We think of God as too much like we are. So what do you do? How do I worship and love a God I can't even comprehend? How do I pray to a being that doesn't have a name? How do I understand a being that I can't even look at? 1 Peter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. What do you do? You surrender. You don't need to figure it out. You don't need to have the answers. He is great. He is mighty. That is all you need to know. He loves you. He's got you. That's all you need to know. Deuteronomy says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The Bible says it flat out. There are things you are not ever going to know. There are secrets, and God alone holds those secrets. But he does say there are things that he does reveal to us. And that's what the Bible is all about. He has told us some things about himself, and they are not a secret. He's given his church a mission field. He's given you talents and gifts so that you can serve him. Deuteronomy says, you know enough. You know enough. You know just enough of what you need to know. Why? That we may do his words. In other words, obey, serve. Look, I'm, I'm glad you are here. I'm ecstatic that you're here. But I don't want you to leave here and think, oh good, now I know a little bit more about God. The point has never been more knowledge. The point, as Deuteronomy says, is to spur you to do the words of the law. In other words, our knowledge of God should lead us to our obedience of God, right? Our knowledge of God should lead us to serving God, lead us to worshiping God. In the 21st century, we are very good at understanding our personal relationship with God, but we cannot ever lose sight of his majesty. We need to comprehend how majestic he really is and celebrate that. His power is not limited. His presence is not limited. His knowledge has no limitations. God is eternal. God is almighty. God is infinite. Our God is truly majestic, and he is worthy of our obedience, our adoration, our praise, our celebration, our love, our prayers, our worship. He is worthy of our time all the time. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. I don't know about you, but God deserves more of my time, not less. Just how can we worship this majesty of God? Just remove those thoughts that limit his greatness. Majesty of God. We need to show the majesty of God in our words and our actions every day and start letting people know 
And it's not going to be with trumpets, and it's not going to be with a you know, magnificent choir, but just in your simple acts of service, you're going to reflect and reveal the glory and the majesty of God. Maybe that's why you're at home. Maybe that's why you're at work. Maybe out on the ball field. and To, to reflect God in your words and in your actions. Maybe it's while you're driving down the road and you're being courteous and careful or when you display a different attitude than all your other coworkers at work. Maybe it's out there in the world that just seems, you know, everything seems so alienated from God. You can just consistently, day after day, witness, share, reflect, and reveal the majesty of God in your conduct. It's the waitress at Olive Garden who says to your family, have a blessed day. That wasn't by accident. That was intentional. And it was to reveal her respect for God's majesty. Austin just had a little baby girl, Charlotte Rose. And if you ever see a newborn baby, it's not uncommon to hear, she's a miracle. Or when you hear good news, any good news, you just respond with, isn't God awesome? Indeed, we have a majestic and awesome God. The psalmist says, Let all the earth fill, fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why not begin every day? Start by showing the majesty and the might of God in everything you say and do. Celebrate God in your life and let others know just the work that he continues to do for you. It's only through his grace that we can do this. We are not perfect. We don't have all the answers, but he does. And, and he has chosen to use this imperfect person, right? Just like you and me, to reveal his might, to reveal his majesty. So what are you waiting for? There was a five little five-year-old little girl. She'd been attending church since she was in kindergarten. And every day before the children were dismissed, the teacher would come in and have the kids sing the doxology, which, you know, the little five-year-old girl, she loved to sing, but she sang it in her own words. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures. Here we go. Let's go and live lives that praise our God. Live lives that elevate Jesus Christ. Praise God. Here we go. Let's worship God together through prayer. Lord, you are majestic, all-powerful, all-knowing, creator God, Father, King, name above names, Lord of all creation. It is by your word that the universe holds together. It is by your will that I live and breathe. Lord, every answer is known to you. Every thought is known to you. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for being our mighty God. Thank you for being our king in all things. We have been fearfully and wonderfully made by you. And we stand in awe of you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, may my life be a reflection of your glory. May my life be a reflection of your majesty. May I bring more glory to you, more worship to you, more praise to you. May I give you more of my time and more of my life. You deserve more because you are more. You are more than I could possibly fathom. You are everything and you are all. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for choosing me. Amen. Thank you for coming back every week and watching these videos. I hope that uh, they're enlightening to you and you know you can always 
copy the, the address at the top. You can always post it to your own Facebook wall. You can let other people know uh, how you spend your Sundays or where you draw inspiration from. And of course, we'd love to see you. We would love to see you here, present with us in fellowship or wherever you live, plug into your local church. Find your local church, plug in, use your gifts, use your talents to serve that body and be the body of Christ. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next week. Bye.